Welcome to Tap into Resilience, Water Now's virtual summit. Good morning and good afternoon to everybody who's joining us. I'm Cynthia Kohler, Water Now's executive director, and we are so happy that you've joined us today for what we know will be an incredible event. As we get underway, I'd like to take a moment to have the Water Now team introduce themselves and share what they're most excited about coming up at the summit. For me, it's the whole event, but I'm especially looking forward to my upcoming conversation with Na National League of Cities CEO, Clarence Anthony. Hello everyone, I'm Amy Weinfitter, Senior Water Resource Specialist here at Water Now Alliance. Uh, in this summit, I am especially looking forward to hearing more about how communities are finding innovative ways to implement green stream water infrastructure during Thursday's session on this topic. Hi everyone, I'm Caroline Cook, Water Now's Water Policy Director. Um, I'm most excited about the upcoming Impact and Emerging Leaders Award ceremony set for Wednesday afternoon. I'm really looking forward to sharing all these inspiring stories with, with you all. Hi everybody, I'm Georgia Biesma. I'm a project manager and I'm really looking forward to my first summit and the culmination of 2020 and 2021 planning. Hello, my name is Iona Miller. I'm the Director of Operations with Water Now Alliance, and I am looking forward to our networking sessions where we can get to know more about our fantastic summit sponsors. Hello, I'm Isabella Clegg. I am a communications consultant for Water Now, and I'm looking forward to seeing how everyone connects and engages with one another on our new virtual platform. Hi, I'm Jesse Bersinger. I'm Water Now's database manager. I'm most excited about our tech exploration panel on Thursday, uh, where we'll learn about innovative technologies that can be used to benefit not only end, uh, end consumers, but uh, the cities and utilities as well. Hi, everyone. I'm Lindsay Rogers, WaterNow's Colorado Basin Program Manager, and I'm looking forward to following our leaderboard for What Are We Winning? When you participate in different summit activities like our sessions or our networking lounges, you'll receive points towards some really great water and sustainability focused prizes. You can learn more by clicking on the What Are We Winning tab on the Summit site. And hi, everybody. I'm Walt Wadlow. I am the Water Now Alliance's Director of Utility Relations. And I am most excited about our World Cafe at 10 a.m. today. So please join us for a great opportunity to meet other water leaders and discuss water issues that are on your mind for your community. <laughs> Thanks everyone. We also have a fantastic leadership council that works closely with us to advance our shared goals. You'll have a chance to meet many of these members over the course of the next couple of days. You can read their bios on the Pathable site. Please think of them as another resource. Um, Tap into Resilience would not be possible without the wonderful support of our sponsors and partners. We are so grateful for their generosity and guidance. And with that, I'm gonna turn things over to Walt Wadlow. Thank you, Cynthia, very much. Um, as Cynthia said, we are really looking forward to spending the next three days with you. And so we wanted to start off and say just a little bit about um, who you are. Um, if you look at this map of the United States, you can see that we have participants from all over the nation with us for the next three days. And I also wanna send a shout out to our friends from Canada who are also going to be visiting with us. Um, clearly, we are just now getting ready to become an international nonprofit. Um, so thank you to our Canadian friends for joining us as well for this. Let me start by saying just a few words uh, uh, about a program that we have going on. You heard Lindsay describe our What Are We Winning? And believe it or not, we already have our first winner in that. Joel Dome, congratulations. You are our first winner in our What Are Now? What? excuse me, what are we winning uh, contest? Uh, and we'll be contacting you with the fantastic prizes that uh, got mentioned earlier. So now let me talk a little bit about our mission, getting down to business. For those of you that are, are not familiar with water now, we are a network of local water leaders working to make climate resilient, affordable, equitable, and environmentally sustainable water solutions the new normal. Our mission is to expand and accelerate adoption of these solutions in cities, towns, and communities nationwide by providing these leaders with resources, tools, 
access and connectivity that they need to be champions for positive change. So why do we focus on local leaders? That's because local decision makers are responsible for 95% of the spending on our nation's water infrastructure. That is drinking water, wastewater, and stormwater. You and your colleagues are the keys to the nation's water future. Let me say a word about sustainability as well. Uh, sustainability gets used a lot as a term. It's one of those terms that gets, means different things to different people. We would like to define it like this. It means providing safe, healthy, and affordable water services for people while preserving the integrity of water resources and the environment for future generations. Some of you were with us when we launched our very first summit five years ago at Arizona State University in Tempe with about 100 people in the room representing a few Western states. Since then, we've grown to a membership of over 700 in 43 states nationwide and soon Canada. Programs we provide include running a project accelerator program designed to assist communities in their efforts to implement more sustainable water practices. We engage in policy work at the state and federal levels to remove barriers to implementing distributed water infrastructure. We help communities navigate their way to federal and other sources of support. We help advance innovative finance solutions to help pay for climate resilient infrastructure. We help ensure that disadvantaged communities have access to water services that they need. And in doing this, we collaborate with dozens of other partner organizations. We have designed and implemented an online tap into resilience program with a toolkit to provide you with the resources you need to understand and implement innovative water solutions. So just a moment about our work now. All of our work is centered on preparing communities for the challenges of a climate changing world. How do we collectively ensure that we can provide the safe, healthy and reliable water services that people, businesses and industries, frankly, all of us need? We will always need our pipes and tanks and tunnels, but there's also a universe of opportunity in innovative one water solutions that is a nation we have barely begun to tap. From modest indoor water efficient plumbing to extremely complex on-site treatment and reuse systems to watershed protection to green infrastructure, these decentralized strategies lie at the heart of our Tap Into Resilience initiative and hold important promise now and for the future if we can bring them to scale. And now we'd like to share a short video with you highlighting the important role that distributed local solutions will have in meeting our nation's future water needs. Our public plumbing is getting old. America's waterworks were cutting edge when they were built a hundred years ago, but a lot has changed. Cities have grown, technology has advanced, and climate change has brought longer droughts, stronger storms, and rising temperatures. The American Society of Civil Engineers gives our drinking and wastewater infrastructure a D grade. We can and must do better. The next wave of water investments should be small scale and tailored to local needs. In the Southwest, that means replacing thirsty lawns with desert-friendly gardens. In the Midwest, it's restoring wetlands and making room for rivers. In cities, it's swapping pavement for plants. And upstream, it's protecting the forests that feed our rivers and reservoirs. These local solutions are cheaper than big dams and pipelines and create jobs and communities. Many rely on nature and provide bonus benefits like green space, cleaner air, and cooling. We're seeing towns across the country embrace localized infrastructure. Seattle has helped homeowners build more than 1,600 rain gardens to catch and clean runoff. Hoboken is using parks with underground storage tanks to reduce flooding and sewage spills. Denver is replacing lead pipes in people's homes to ensure safe water and reduce treatment costs. Historically, this kind of on-site solution has made up a tiny percentage of water spending. 
but a series of small projects can make a big difference. By stretching water supplies and preventing pollution, we can reduce the need for more costly projects and keep water bills down. The future of water is local. It's time to update our waterworks with solutions that will serve our communities for the next 100 years. It was a privilege to work with our colleagues at the Water Hub on this video. And as you will see in this summit, we've designed our Tap into Resilience initiative exactly along these lines to solve or contribute to solving our water challenges. Transitioning to native landscaping, to create new water supply, restoring wetlands to limit flooding, green, initiative, green infrastructure to capture and treat polluted stormwater runoff, and preserving watershed forests to protect water quality. These are just a few examples of how we can re-envision water infrastructure. Tap into Resilience recognizes that what is common to these strategies is that we invest and deploy these at large scale. Integrated as part of a one water approach to water management, they can provide tremendous benefits to communities not only because they provide the same service as conventional infrastructure does, water supply, treatment, managing runoff, but because they can often provide these services more equitably and more affordably while building climate resilience. And we're going to come back to this theme throughout this entire summit. And with that, I'll turn it back to our executive director, Cynthia Kohler, to introduce our keynote speaker for today. Thank you so much, Walt. Um, we are so delighted and honored to have with us as our opening keynote speaker, Anthony, uh, Clarence Anthony, CEO and Executive Director of the National League of Cities, the largest and oldest organization representing America's cities and towns and their leaders. NLC has been a key partner for Water Now since our launch five years ago. Clarence comes to his leadership at NLC after a long career um, in local government. He served as the mayor of South Bay, Florida for 24 years and as the president of the Florida League of Cities and the National League of Cities. He has made sustainability a priority during his tenure as NLC's chief. Welcome Clarence Anthony, and I believe you have a few opening remarks. Thank you so much, Cynthia, and thank you all for having me. So what do I want to uh, achieve or see happen uh, through this conference this week? I want to see a strengthening relationship and partnership with the uh, Water Now Alliance. That's my goal. So I know that we will be able to do that. And um, I know that everyone uh, that is in this virtual room in this conference, um, that water is your life and is our lives. Um, and we recognize that our bodies are made up of 60% water and more than 70% of the earth is covered in water. And water remains one of the most frequently overused and underappreciated natural resource in our country. That is, some say, until 2020. Because clearly the pandemic has just uh, changed us in so many ways, had us thinking about things that were just normal, and now we see them as essential. And I think that as we as city leaders and municipal leaders and public servants and private companies have to rethink how we th uh, think of water and how we think of our climate, how do we think of our society? You know, water became an essential and vital commodity in our communities and the country as we fought uh, this global pandemic. A pandemic for which uh, access to clean and safe water was crucial to health and safety. And I must also say, and that reality meant that local leaders really had to think differently and we heard so many times from our members that water issues were one of the big things that they were struggling with because we saw so many people uh, having to uh, having their water shut off or six, uh, suspending uh, water connection efforts uh, because of the pandemic. 
because there was a recognition that we must work together uh, to address uh, water availability through this pandemic. But we also heard their concerns from the residents from whom the bills uh, were adding up. And for many cities, the direct aid included in the America Rescue Plan really will allow uh, city leaders to help residents uh, with their mounting water bills. At least that's what we're encouraging our public leaders to think of this rescue plan as a, a way to help in fact rescue those citizens that are being impacted at this time. Just last week, uh, Mayor Dugan in Detroit, uh, Michigan, extending the city's water shutoff moratorium and said his goal is to stop shutoffs to low income Detroiters once and for all. But he's still in the minority because leaders have not been able to educate and to get their residents to really understand that this is something that we need to, as partners with our residents, uh, provide as a long-term goal. You know, there's still a lot of education and advocacy that must be done to make sure a lot of the political leaders and corporations understand that, um, you know, making sure that we have a viable and sustainable utility system and water availability is just like infrastructure just like housing, education, and healthcare. But affordability is just one of the challenges facing local leaders. This year, the American Society for Civil Engineers in its annual report card had some poor grades for the country's water infrastructure, a C minus for drinking water and a D plus for wastewater and a D for stormwater. And I know we will hear this over and over again as we go through this conference. It's one thing to give the grade. It's another thing to figure out how do we make sure that we don't continue to have the, the C minuses and a D plus for any of these areas. Because we know from our days in school at every level, if we brought home a D, a D plus or a D minus, our parents, our friends would not be satisfied with that. And neither is the National League of Cities. And I know neither are you as Alliance members are satisfied with where we are, but we can do some about it. In the West, years of drought and threatening the availability of water and wildfire cre cre wildfires create hazardous materials that can threaten the quality of, of our water. So we recognize that. And in the upper Midwest, Iowa alone has seen several, uh, I'd say 500 year flood events just within the last decade. And most recently in the South, the winter storm in February is, um, is expected to be the single most expensive disaster in Texas history. And residents in the cities like Houston, Texas, or Jackson, Mississippi, went almost a month without public water. We also know that every time these events happen, it most often has the greatest impact on people who are brown, black, and indigenous in populations, and they suffer the most. You know, we all think back about what occurred in Flint, Michigan. And we oftentimes say that we were astonished in 2014 when this revelation occurred. But many of us in this room know that we weren't surprised that our water infrastructure is worn and in dire need for replacement and upgrade. The US Water Alliance estimates that more than I'd say 2 million Americans live without running water and basic indoor plumbing, and many more without sanitation. Another five to seven million Americans are on the private on private well systems that are known to be contaminated, but those are outside of EPA jurisdiction, according to the Great Lakes now. In addition, the issue of equity, affordability, climate impacts, 
our nation's infrastructure is aging and, and are way beyond the 50 to 75 year lifespan. Our cities, towns, and villages are also facing an increase in federal and state unfunded mandates with limited fiscal resources. They're also stifled by state preemption on local ability to raise revenue. And I don't need to tell this audience about the important and necessary work that still needs to be done so that our water infrastructure finally gets an A and an A plus in terms of how we're responding. That's why NLC is pleased to partner with the Water Now Alliance, who's committed to educating and supporting local leaders who want to champion and adopt sustainable, affordable, resilient water strategies. And I'm pleased to join one of NLC's fundest partner, the Water Now Alliance here today. And I'm proud to say that on behalf of the 19,000 cities, towns, and villages, we are on the front lines and committed to working to ensure that clean water is available, accessible, and affordable to residents in their neighborhoods and communities during this, during this important time and crisis. And we're, import, we're, we're also very proud because I remember when in 2014, we were a part of the Water Now Alliance founding working actively to grow this important network of local leaders, researchers, and policy analysts. And we're proud that NLC's Director of Sustainability, Cooper Martin, served on the Leadership Council since his inception. I'm also excited that you have invited some of our members who are on the forefront of working um, on this issue, mayors, council members, and other leaders who are committed to making sure that we get quality and affordable and a sustainable systems all over America. Over the last five years, NLC and the Water Now Alliance has worked in partnership to provide deeper support to local leaders on a number of issues related to sustainability and water infrastructure and accessibility. And we're gonna keep doing that and during the past year, as NLC fought and delivered direct aid to every city, town, and village as a part of the American Rescue Act, Water Alliance was one of our strongest partners. And if you're an elected official listening now, you need to find out exactly how much your city is getting from the rescue plan and see how we can create opportunities for this money to help replace lead pipes and opportunities to make sure that the systems that we create are quality systems as we look at maintenance. It can keep businesses open. It can keep residents from being evicted. Perhaps like NLC, Water Now Alliance are vital. Our organizations are vital right now for advocacy and education. And together, I can tell you, I am 100% committed that we deal with the issue of equity because we can help to create these systems and we not be able to say that they help the least of those in communities throughout America. NLC represents cities, towns, and villages. We're the voice, but we can't do it alone. And we have partnered with the Alliance and supporting and sending joint letters to the administration about the importance of getting infrastructure dollars straight to every city, town, and village. One thing that I'll say unites us and brings us together in this time that we are working uh, to get water as a major priority for America, and that is our commitment to the fundamental goal is to make sure that accessible and affordable drinking water is available to everyone in America. And that we create systems that will prevent stormwater and wastewater runoff 
and conserve our lakes and rivers and watersheds. Whether the community is large, rural town, or just the city of a small community, NLC has heard from our members across the country that they are committed to safe and sustainable infrastructure that ensures their residents has access to clean water. I know that I am 100% committed to partnering. I'm 100% committed that every person in every city, no matter their race, economic status, will be able to get access to healthy and clean water. So Cynthia, you have a long-term partner and we will work together to make sure that every citizen in America has the ability to have that type of life in every community throughout America. So thank you all for having me. And I look forward to our conversation today. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Clarence. It is always so inspiring to hear you. And we value our partnership with you and your team at National League of Cities incredibly, you know, more than you can imagine. So we do want to move into the questions part of our time together. And I want to remind those who are attending, you can put any questions you have for Clarence in the Pathable polling tab. And, um, and we'll, uh, we'll get to those when we have, if we have time to do that. So um, just starting off, Clarence, um, you know, with your experience um, on the local level, you served as mayor of South Bay, Florida for over 20 years. So you've been in the shoes of many of the people who are participating here and are members of both NLC and Water Now. How does that experience inform your perspective on representing cities at the federal level? Are there any particular insights that you bring to helping local water leaders thinking about today's challenges beyond obviously, you know, we need more resources, but um, we'd, I'd love to hear, I mean, I'm sure our attendees would as well, um, you know, how you bring forward that, that very rich experience that you had um, working on the local level. Yeah, Cynthia, thank you for that question. Um, not only do I bring the political uh, experience of of leading a small rural community, I bring um, a life experience of how important uh, water quality and water is. Uh, grew up in Florida, a very rural community around Lake Okeechobee, and there was surface water that we had to um, use in order to uh, provide uh, water to our community. And um, it was a difficult time uh, because um, I recognize not as a young kid, but as the mayor, that every time there was a change in our weather patterns, whether it's a storm, uh, heavy rains, it changed the mixture of our, and the need to uh, change the way in which we uh, provided water. And then I went out to the water plant and I saw all of the fertilizer and the other things that came off of Lake Okeechobee. I won't even tell you guys some of the things that came off of that system. And it dawned on me that as a kid, that's what I was drinking. That's just the water quality of that community. And we had to put so many chemicals in it to get it to a point where it was drinkable. And it woke me up. And I think that I hope this whole story wakes up most municipal officials because a lot of times we run because we talk about public safety. We run because we wanna talk about uh, issues of affordable housing. Most often, and even in my case, I didn't think about the pipes that were underground. I didn't think about the water systems and the wastewater systems that we needed to improve because the people didn't see uh, those systems. And so as I became mayor, I really had to figure out how I would address that issue. And many of the issues that we had to face was quality, affordability, but also how do we fund um, uh, our system improvement? and. I must tell you that our goal was uh, to first get the water clean and safe. And that was the fundamental thing 
that I learn and I take bring to this job because if that water and the chemical spills that uh, occurred, I feel from the water systems um, wasn't improved, uh, then that would have effect on our residents. And I also had to deal with affordability uh, because the cost of running and managing a small system and the construction uh, in the improvements and the requirements from EPA, we had to also consider. Now, eventually, uh, what we had to do, and I would encourage small systems to think about this, um, I hope that you would think about regional uh, service systems, because we had to, in fact, uh, turn our small system that served um, a community of five to 7,000 people, um, we had to create a regional system and that addressed some of our affordability issues. And also it, it, it brings me back to the equity issue. Um, so often uh, the calls that I would get was because um, the population of our community was very poor and most of them were uh, minority and I would get the calls about my water being shut off. Um, my check doesn't come until the first. Uh, I work in the celery in the, the sugarcane fields and um, I'm sorry, we got off at nine o'clock la last night and I wasn't able to get to city hall. So I think about my life experience and my political experience and I bring that to this job every day because I know that there are a lot of clearances out there that grew up in systems that weren't um, prosperous, in fact, poor. Um, and I bring that to my decision-making and I bring that to the commitment that I have to working with you, you um, Cynthia, and, and your team, because um, I'm not giving up on the notion that we need to get um, water, quality water to every resident in America. I, I so appreciate that. And your strong commitment to that is, is, is fantastic. We're, we're right there with you. Um, that's a great segue to um, one of our first questions from the audience, which is what types of initiatives is the National League of Cities conducting to bring that, that D, those Ds and those Cs up to at least a B? Yeah, what we're doing is um, we are working uh, with our municipal leaders, uh, providing solutions, uh, education, training, awareness about um, the report that um, uh, the Mer American Society of Engineers are, are sending out and saying, here are some of the things that you could work on. First of all, we're going to try to get you additional funding uh, from the federal government so that you can uh, uh, make sure your system is, is updated and it's a system that can provide that safe uh, and accessible clean water uh, to all of your residents. Uh, the other thing is through our conferences and through partnerships like uh, with you all, with the Alliance, we're doing training, webinars, and education to all of our members about ways in which you can improve your systems. And finally, I would say uh, we're making this issue um, more, of, more of an issue of awareness. Like I said, you know, infrastructure, when you think of infrastructure, the first thing uh, folks think of is roads and bridges. Our water and wastewater and stormwater systems is also infrastructure. Um, we're, we're asking our members um, to prioritize funding in these areas. And so if we can get aligned with the money, uh, the, the, the program implementation, uh, as well as with the commitment to funding water, wastewater, and stormwater <laughs> infrastructure, I think we'll see uh, more improvements, but we got to invest in it. I, I couldn't agree more. And there's all sorts of ways of thinking about infrastructure, even within that water space, right? I mean, not every, I mean, the pipes and the tanks critical, but um, also all other kinds of alternatives 
alternative infrastructure to really stretch those systems and, and extend their lifetimes and make them provide even greater benefits. So on the funding piece, I think what's on top of mind for everybody right now are these federal recovery bills. There's the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021 that provided almost 640 million for low-income household assistance to pay water bills. The American Rescue Plan contained another 500 million um, extending that program. And now, um, just last week, um, I'm sure you've had a chance to um, uh, absorb every detail of the new um, American Jobs Plan, which um, of course is very extensive, very focused on infrastructure. And we were pleased to see, to the point that you just made, um, that it wasn't just roads and bridges and tunnels, but there was an entire section on water infrastructure. Uh, the proposal is for 11 billion um, for water. Um, what do you, you know, I'd love to hear your thoughts about that. I mean, on the one hand, that's that's a big number. That's great. It's much smaller than is being provided for, um, you know, transportation, but still 11, you know, 111 billion for water infrastructure um, really would be a change for the federal government, <clears throat> which has really seen declining support for water infrastructure. Yeah, I think um, over the years, um, we've all try to redefine what infrastructure uh, has been in the federal space. Because again, the definition has always been, um, you know, in, in my years, over 30 years of being in public policy, uh, you know, you had that picture again of the roads and the bridges. And we finally got uh, the federal government to uh, look at infrastructure more broadly. And the other thing is, you know, we got so much bipartisanship in uh, Washington, D.C., and now at all levels, actually. And um, I can tell you that this is a bipartisan issue. Uh, how you pay for it is probably the most challenging thing that President uh, Biden plan includes. Uh, so we got to figure out how we work with um, Congress as NLC and on this bipartisan package uh, that includes infrastructure, uh, workforce, and economic um, uh, programs to rebuild uh, our nation. You know, for us, uh, it means um, a, a number of things. I, I think we got to get to a point where we focus on how we finance. Uh, and there's traditional loan programs, the clean water and drinking water, state revolving loan fund program. Um, but we know not every community can afford these loan programs because if you're struggling now to keep your system up um, based upon EPA requirements, you know, how are you gonna get another loan to pay for um, the, that improvement. So we wanna see more grant programs and opportunities for local governments for drinking water, wastewater, stormwater management programs that support, support resilience. Um, you know, we gotta look at innovative technology and these gotta be, you know, also the lead pipe replacement. So we got so many um, ways in which we need to get these dollars. And finally, I am very committed to this. We got to make this also a jobs program, a workforce development program. So um, we need local flexibility um, to enhance our, our, our affordability of, for our residents. And we got to partner with the state and the federal government to meet the infrastructure needs or we won't achieve what we need to achieve uh, to make sure that the burden is not so much on the ratepayers, but we get dollars to make sure that we uh, are able to make it affordable. So as we look at it, affordability, we all know these words that I've used in my days of being um, in the business of water and engineering, um, integrated planning. Um, we got to look at the ways in which we um, integrate everything as a part of our water systems. And that will require policy changes that uh, will make a dramatic difference in terms of affordability and equity. So I'm excited about um, the money that is in there uh, for water uh, transportation, but we have to make sure that once it gets to us, that it is a plan that um, is comprehensive, if that makes sense, Cynthia.
It absolutely makes sense. And, you know, going right, and you've been so eloquent on the issue of equity and affordability. They're not the same thing. They obviously, you know, overlap somewhat. But just to go right to that, in a year when access to clean and reliable water has been critical for, because of the pandemic, um, has also exposed and compounded the inequities that you've been talking about around affordability and accessibility that were already there before. Um, so what strategies have you seen from municipal leaders or would you recommend you know, facing these twin challenges of assuming, because they really go directly against each other, of ensuring that their communities have the resources they need to provide these ex essential and let's face it, expensive services while also fully protecting um, the vulnerable and disadvantaged um, communities among us? Yeah, the pandemic has brought uh, a lot of uh, gaps. Uh, racial it's shown us about the gaps that exist in America, the racial gaps, the income gaps, um, you know, your zip code determining the quality of your lifestyle. And, and throughout, local leaders have been committed to working with the residents and businesses to make sure that they have clean and healthy water. And many communities have offered help uh, to residents and businesses on utility bills. And of course, the rescue plan uh, provides funds as well. Um, one example that I've read about and has been very successful is the city of Riley, North Carolina, working with Wake County to establish a utility customer assistance uh, program in response to COVID-19. And they get qualified customers uh, are eligible to get up to $240 each fiscal year applied directly to their ut utility account. And I think that that's important that we recognize that the pandemic um, has really impacted uh, residents. And I sometimes I don't think we really uh, recognize that, especially uh, Black, Indigenous, and communities of color, as well as low income and fixed income people. Um, we've done a number of things to try to get information out there in terms of addressing fines and forfeitures and fees. Um, our equity project to help um, really city leaders assess the impact of these fines and fees and then help them to come up with strategies. So if you can't pay your water bill or your wastewater system bill, you can't pay your house, house uh, homeownership bill, and then you're thrown out. I mean, it just have a, a really, really um, a, a snowball impact on, on the residents. So we got to find ways to get that assistance to the residents so that their lives are not upended. And so we are excited in any way to work with you all on any program that can address the equity issues um, that exist in cities, towns, and villages. It needs to happen. And we have a lot of work and, and, and rep uh, reports in this area. So we'd love to share it with your members. That would be, we would so welcome that. And um, we'll be talking a lot about affordability and equity throughout the summit. In particular, we have a program coming up called Powerful Partnerships that um, we worked with your team on. Um, a lot of a lot of very cool, innovative stuff is happening when you bring NGOs and utilities together to address exactly the issues you're raising um, of affordability and ensuring that um, you know, communities of color are not impacted and that they are getting the support that they need to address these, um, you know, these bills and still, you know, have full access to these, these critical services. So we'll look forward to talking with you more about that and definitely want to work with you in, in bringing those solutions to your, your members. Um, that might be a great um, segue to our next question. You've touched on workforce development, and that's another way to address um, equity and affordability issues in communities. Um, there is so much opportunity and there's so much need to be um, developing not just conventional but new forms of uh, water infrastructure to deal with all of the issues you've been discussing. Um, you know, and that has always seemed to us and to a number of our partner organizations as well, and I know to you, to be not just we're dealing with our water problem, but we're also creating economic um, opportunities. We're also developing our local workforces. So, you know, what kinds of opportunities do you see for municipal leaders to bring a new class of workers, you know, in and really diversify this field as we are, as we're broadening how we think about water infrastructure to make sure that everybody has access 
to, as you've said, you know, clean drinking water, sanitation, stormwater management? Well, I'm, I'm going to be really, really direct on this. I mean, uh, city leaders, um, county leaders, state leaders, you guys make decisions on what companies, um, what plans that you put together, and you need to put community benefit agreements throughout all of those plans to make sure that the folks that live in your cities, towns, and villages um, get a chance to work on those projects, to develop your talent, diversify your workforce that's right in your backyard. And I can tell you that a lot of uh, our utility folks are retiring um, and we can help educate and train the next leaders, but you have to have it as a decision uh, variable that you make in terms of adoption of the plan as well as hiring firms. I used to work for three engineering firms professionally in the water, wastewater area, transportation area. And when the community said, you must put goals in here to hire local, minority, women, and other categories that live in that community, they did it. So we must put it in there. Also, you got to partner with community colleges uh, technical institutes, because I think a lot of times we think success is going to one of these Ivy Leagues universities and getting a four year um, uh, job, uh, four year degree. Um, I can tell you there are a lot of folks that went to those four year colleges that don't make as much as the plumber and the wastewater manager and the scientist. Find ways to partner with those um, uh, agencies to make sure we make sure that those community benefits um, are, uh, are achieved by the community, not some group that comes in and then gets the talent and they leave your community. There's a skills gap that we need to fill, but I know we can do it, but we have to be intentional uh, in terms of our planning and agreements that we have uh, to make sure that those systems are uh, improved, but those that live there, they get a chance to benefit. Yeah, absolutely. And, and along those lines, we talk a lot at Water Now, and you've touched on this, on the concept of one water, um, integrating drinking water, wastewater, and stormwater management. And in fact, we're giving a number of awards at tomorrow's um, Impact Awards ceremony to leaders at all municipal levels who are making real advances in this area. So we have a question from the audience about um, uh, needing recognition of green infrastructure solutions, um, which are affordable, often, you know, offer significant equity benefits. Um, but it's one thing to sort of talk about them, you know, we also need to actually, um, you know, uh, make it more feasible, make it easier for communities to move in that direction. So the question from the audience is, will NLC be advocating any regulatory changes to promote a one water approach? Yes, um, I think that, well, that is a part of our um, uh, national municipal policy uh, to um, promote and encourage um, green investment, green bond programs. Um, and I think it's going to take a lot of um, education because even in the private sector market, you know, we got this ESG, uh, environmental social uh, bond programs that people don't know about. And they are often um, nervous about uh, investing in new infrastructure um, or finance uh, structures. Um, but we think that innovative programs uh, that involve environmental impact bonds and other results oriented financing programs can encourage cities uh, to try new things. And I, I, I believe that that's uh, important, but yes, NLC is 100% uh, supporting. Great, and then along those lines, we have a very active audience. This is fantastic. Um, what do you view as a significant innovation or solution that is needed for post-pandemic water infrastructure? And we've obviously been talking about some of that, but is there anything else you'd like to add onto that to address that question? Yeah, I, I think, um, I, I do think that this is a great time and we shouldn't let this time uh, go by without thinking innovative. Um, and um, with, you know, the virtual systems that we have, I think there's a chance here that we can 
open up our systems to our residents uh, by using um, technology to let them see the system, see how it works, educate them, and then we'd be able to get their support for investment. Um, the other thing is, I would also uh, stretch ourselves to start uh, creating a pipeline uh, for future uh, workforce um, members. Uh, again, using this time through technology innovation uh, to um, partner with uh, universities and colleges all over America uh, as a profession is, is very, very timely right now, especially historic black colleges and universities. Um, I think that we are behind in terms of skills and talents at this time. So this is our time to be innovative. Um, also, again, I've talked about that regionalism. I still think the small and regional, small towns and villages, I loved having my own system. But I will tell you that I waited probably five to 10 years too long to have that conversation about how we create quality um, water, wastewater systems on a regional level that was affordable to my residents because it's this thing, I need to have my own system. Um, there is a way to provide the governance and manage uh, the system in a, in a, a proper manner. Yeah, um, that that issue of consolidation can be politically charged, um, but it sounds like you feel from your experience that moving in that direction is ultimately beneficial for communities and we should be helping them to, you know, be a little bit more open to that and, you know, assess those costs and benefits. Yeah, it almost cost me my reelection, but it was the right thing to do. So I'm not going out here telling you uh, mayors and council members to go back next week and say, we should give up our water and wastewater system uh, or privatize. That's, that's not what I'm saying. I think right, right. Uh, it works for some communities and it doesn't work for others, but I think it has to be on the table as you look toward the future of getting quality, affordable, uh, equitable uh, water uh, to all your residents. Absolutely. So we are just about at the end of our time together. So I want to be sure that I give you time to share any final thoughts or challenges for our participants. I, I love your challenges and I, I'm guessing you have one for us today. Well, I think um, as I uh, considered uh, this opportunity, I, I just could not uh, leave here uh, to say that um, first, I, I, I think um, we need to strengthen um, our relationships and partnerships in America if we're going to address uh, the issue of quality water and systems in America. I'd like to cha challenge the audience, regardless of your position or your role or your power of influence, um, I hope that you will take advantage, advantage of the opportunity to um, elevate sustainability and equity in your work as well as um, within every organization uh, that you're in. And I think the, the, the difficult part sometimes is the first step of making, creating that space to have these conversations. We must admit that we have to, at this point, deal with equity and we have to deal with sustainability. Our communities and our nation uh, is open to it right now. So this is our time and National League of Cities uh, is committed to working with all of you to make sure that we get the solutions and we find champions. I love your website where it talks, uh, Cynthia, about developing champions. That's what we need to do at the National League of Cities. So I'm gonna steal that one. Um, and I'm also going to give credit the first time I talk about it, um, I'll, I'll, I'll say, Water Now gave me this idea, but after that, it's gonna be mine. We need, <laughs> we need more champions and I'm committed to that um, work. Thank you guys for having me. Thank you so much, Clarence Anthony. It is always a privilege and so inspiring to have the chance to speak with you. Thank you so much for your partnership and your support. And we look forward to that collaboration continuing. Um, okay, so we are just about um, on time, not, not too bad. So I'm gonna thank everybody 
who is um, participating in this session to thank you for your attendance. Please use the link in the Pathable chat to go to Tap Into Connections, which is the Water Now World Cafe, which is a great opportunity to connect with people. Um, it's a lot of fun. We're, we're doing all that we can to make it um, fun in the virtual space, just like it is in the real world. Um, and then at 10 o'clock um, Pacific time, sorry, at 11 o'clock Pacific time, we have a fantastic panel on the role of local leadership in shaping our national water future. We will look forward to seeing you there. And thanks for being here. Have a great conference, everybody.